If you are black, this is your fight. We cannot allow our taxpayer dollars to go toward the oppression of the Palestinian people. We are anti-war, we are anti-occupation, and we are anti-apartheid, period. Standing in solidarity, African-American lawmakers and Black Lives Matter activists express their support for Palestinian rights as they continue their fight for racial justice in the U.S. one year since the murder of George Floyd. Hello and welcome to Inside America with me, Rida Fahri. A year ago this week, the disturbing images of the murder of George Floyd by a police officer in Minneapolis galvanized the Black Lives Matter movement across the United States and sparked protests all over the U.S., reigniting calls for an end to police violence against African Americans and demanding accountability for police officers who perpetrate these crimes. The BLM movement resonated across the world with millions of people marching in solidarity, but it struck a particular chord with Palestinians living under a brutal Israeli occupation for decades. George Floyd's image was painted on the Israeli annexation wall built in and around the occupied West Bank. A few days after Floyd's cold-blooded murder last May, a Palestinian man, Iyad al-Halak, was shot dead by Israeli police. Like Floyd, he was unarmed. He was also autistic and on his way to a special needs school in East Jerusalem. Protesters in Palestine held up posters with his image next to George Floyd's with the slogan, From the USA to Palestine, Racism is a Crime. Today, many BLM activists have come out in support of Palestinians living under Israeli occupation using hashtags like Free Palestine and Save Sheikh Jarrah. Last week, the official BLM Twitter account posted this, Black Lives Matter stands in solidarity with Palestinians. We are a movement committed to ending settler colonialism in all forms and will continue to advocate for Palestinian liberation. In a few moments, I'll be joined by Talib Kweli, the American rapper and activist who's faced censorship for speaking up for Palestinian rights. But first, among the many African-American voices expressing solidarity with Palestinians, Politicians, both in the U.S. Congress and in local state legislatures, are speaking out. One of them is Minnesota State Senator Omar Fateh, who co-authored with fellow Minnesota legislators a letter to President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken demanding action to end violence on Palestinians. State Senator Omar Fateh joins me now. Senator Fateh, a year ago, your state, Minnesota, was the epicenter of the struggle for racial justice here in the United States, the struggle for equality after the murder of George Floyd. It is still in the midst of a racial reckoning. Just how important is it for you to call for justice for Palestinians when there is still so much work to do in your own fight for equal rights here in the United States? Well, I think that uh, silence tends to favor the status quo. Um, by speaking out against crimes against humanity, um, American politicians um, and leaders in public life, they create a space for us to actually move uh, the dial on the decades old status quo. And that's why uh, we have been speaking out and encouraging others to do so as well. Um, the only way things change is by applying pressure to our leaders. Uh, the institutions and power structures favoring the status quo are uh, so deeply entrenched that the only way for us to uh, create those conditions for change is for that pressure to come um, from the people, from the people on the ground. But, but does it matter, though, for a majority of people in Minnesota? It matters to you, and you did mention this in your letter to uh, President Biden and his Secretary of State. You said you want to, the U.S. government to make clear to, quote, uh, our ally, Israel, that U.S. tax dollars will no longer be used to support atrocities against the Palestinian people. Right. But Biden responded with an ironclad support for Israel. He's made it repeatedly clear. So too have many members of Congress from both parties. Yep. Many American voters are opposed to their tax money going to fund the illegal Israeli occupation to send more weapons to Israel. And you do form an important voting bloc. You make up some 13% of the U.S. population. Can you leverage that to demand a policy change on this issue? Does it matter to enough African-American voters to, to see it Absolutely. change? Absolutely, not just African-American voters, I think just voters of color in general and people showing solidarity with this issue. 
um, what we've seen is just as we've seen the, uh, the national movements, uh, people take to the streets and protesting uh, police brutality. We're seeing that in our own state. We're seeing that uh, nationwide protests happening in support of the Palestinian people and their struggles. And we're seeing that actually take place globally as well. Um, so now it'll take that uh, pressure from the population, from the people uh, to put on their leaders uh, to create that change. So I think that uh, we're slowly seeing the dial shift, um, that people are starting to care and starting to wake up and see what is happening. Um, or we do, like you said, we don't want our tax dollars going to fund uh, the killing uh, of, of civilians. Minnesota State Senator Omar Fateh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. With lawmakers in the U.S. calling on the Biden administration to support Palestinian struggle for equality, a growing number of artists, actors, and musicians are also expressing their solidarity with Palestinians, despite the pressures they face to remain silent. Singer Dua Lipa and models Gigi and Bella Hadid were accused of anti-Semitism in a New York Times ad for voicing support for Palestinians and criticizing Israel's military actions against them. The British pop star responded to the ad, paid for by the pro-Israel organization World Values Network, by saying, quote, This is the price you pay for defending Palestinian human rights against an Israeli government whose actions in Palestine, both Human Rights Watch and the Israeli human rights group B'Tselem, accuse of persecution and discrimination. Unquote. Now, two years ago, Talib Kweli, an internationally acclaimed American rapper, faced censure in Europe for expressing his support for the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. He was disinvited from the Open Source Festival in Dusseldorf, Germany, after refusing to denounce the BDS movement for Palestinian rights. Talib Kweli is among the many African-American activists who have voiced their support for Palestinians under attack in occupied Palestine. He joins me now. Talib Kweli, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. You're one of the best known rappers in the world, one of the most socially conscious, politically engaged musicians. You've used your voice, your influence to speak up against the injustices that Palestinians face. You refused to denounce the BDS movement when you were pressured to, and you didn't mince your word when you issued a statement saying this, by lying and saying that BDS is an anti-Semitic movement, the German government is engaging in fascism Palestinians are treated like second-class citizens. White supremacy is insidious like that. Why is it important for you to speak up in defense of Palestinian rights when so many in your industry choose to remain silent? I want to point out that the backlash that artists get, uh, people in my industry, for standing up for Palestine is not comparable to what Palestinians actually go through, right? So people say that we're very brave and sure, everything is relative and in the context of what we do, it could be considered brave, but it's very easy to do this when you consider what Palestinians are actually going through. And, um, you know, when I got that backlash, um, I, I wanna say that I appreciate people who support BDS and I appreciate people who stand up for free Palestine because I've received an education. Um, my support for BDS, I'm not like that guy waving the BDS flag. I got booked for a show in Israel. I've always shown solidarity with Palestine in my music and my activism, but I didn't understand the scope of the boycott. And so I was asked by supporters of B BDS to not support, to not go do the show in Israel. And I ended up canceling the show in Israel because I got the education. You also mentioned in one of the statements that you put out uh, a couple of years ago following this incident that it is the opposite of terrorism, you said, that BDS worked to make South Africa a more fair and equal nation. And mm -hmm. it could work in Israel if you say its opponents were not so anti-black and anti-Muslim. You also said, I'd rather be a decent human being and stand up for what's right than censor myself and lie about BDS for a check. When you spoke out and you refused to be censored, 103 artists, filmmakers, playwrights, actors, singers like Peter Gabriel and so many others condemned the attempts to impose political conditions on artists who support Palestine. I just wonder if today you are seeing a continuation of this anti-Palestinian censorship uh, trend, this, uh, this attempt mm -hmm. to link criticism of the Israeli government with anti-Semitism, or is the tide beginning to shift in Europe well, do, and in the United that, States? Yeah, I do think the tide is, is beginning to shift. Um, and I, you know, I don't know how you feel about it, but I think it needs to be all hands on deck. Um, the problem with this type of activism is people speak on these things without knowing the history. 
um, people speak on the Middle East, um, you speak on uh, Israel versus Palestine without knowing the actual history. I do not want famous people, celebs, to be speaking on things without knowing what they're talking about. Even if your intentions are, are good, you could be harmful by trying to add on to the conversation without gaining the context. So again, I like to shift my focus to the activist and the people who are doing the work. How much has the increasing use of the word apartheid in the Israeli-Palestinian context mm -hmm. galvanized African-Americans like you and others to see the similarities between Israel's policies toward Palestinians mm -hmm. and South Africa's apartheid rule against the black indigenous population? That's a great question. Um, this apartheid situation in South Africa, my parents were heavily involved in anti-apartheid work as black Americans. And so that was something I was raised to be against apartheid, especially in South Africa. The way that I understood Palestine was through that lens. That helped me to understand what the Palestinian people were going through when I was able to compare it to what South Africa went through. But I will say this, I, and I don't, you know, people might, what I'm about to say, people might say that I'm cowardly for saying it. But in conversations around Israel, I have limited my use of the word apartheid. And the reason why I've limited my use of the word apartheid is because that, in my experience, personal anecdotal experience, starts to derail the conversation and starts to allow people to br bring up subjects about semantics that we're not even talking about. So unless they were talking about it to someone who's a Zionist or someone who is pro-Israel, then I start using the word palace, I start using the word apartheid, then they say, well, what's the definition of apartheid? Is this really apartheid? And it's just, and then, then we start to have an hour-long conversation about what apartheid is. Whether you call it apartheid or not, it's atrocious, it's evil, it's bad. But whether you use the word apartheid or not, clearly there are real consequences. That's right. For those who choose to speak up honestly about what's going on, for That's those right. who use words like systemic oppression, injustice, uh, right. occupation, settler colonialism, whether it's politicians facing powerful special interest groups or artists whose careers depend on remaining silent. Mm. Uh, what has it been like for you to express this level of solidarity to support the struggle for justice. What has been the cost for you? Um, I mean, the cost is I lost some shows. The show I was booked in to perform in Israel that when I educated myself, I, that show I was getting paid more than I've ever been paid for a show in my life. You understand? So as an artist, and people are not supporting artists like this. People are not rushing to the stores to buy our albums. Like as an artist, I, I have a family. I have to figure out the best way to support my family. So yeah, I lost, I've lost uh, uh, tens of that, uh, maybe over hundred thousands of dollars by supporting Palestine. But what I've gained in cultural currency far more than makes up for that loss. And what I've gained in the loss and the love of the people more than makes up for any finances. And you are among the more independent artists who are able to speak up. But what about the young up and coming musicians and artists who aren't, whose, or, whose careers are tied to the big labels and to some of these interests? I mean, whether you're a young up and coming artist or whether you're, you know, Mark Ruffalo, who works with Disney, you know, um, people are going to have um, people are going to pe be penalized. People are going to be um, marginalized. People are going to have their their, their careers put in jeopardy. Um, the more that people speak up publicly about it, the more that we normalize being honest about what's going on with Palestine, the better it is for artists. But again, us artists are extremely privileged in this situation. The focus has to be on the people actually living in Palestine. It was what made me decide to cancel my show in Israel was, was rappers, damn, from, from Palestinian rappers who, who were involved in that struggle, who actually living out there called me. And they said, we are Black Star fans. We would love to see you, Kwali. We would love to see you. Please still respect the boycott anyway. And how could I, how could I say no to that? How could I say as a Black American rapper that I know more about that struggle than actual Palestinian rappers who are going through it? And you watched one of those young Palestinian rappers, a 12-year-old Palestinian called Abdurrahman Al-Shanti, rapping as he walked past the rubble in Gaza. Yes. Here's some of his song, music. Palestine's been occupied for decades, but I hope for centuries. This land is generations of my family's memories to play and grow and nurture the symbol of peace. The olive tree is guaranteed that our people could eat. What is your message to young people like that? How much of an impact does this sort of music by a 12-year-old in Gaza have on you? 
Well, first of all, that young man, um, I almost brought a tear to my eye when I saw that. His skill level at 12 years old is uncanny. It's more than exceptional. It's, I mean, for, he should not be that good at 12 years old, but hip hop is music of struggle. Hip hop is music of culture. And this is a, a very beautiful culture that has been suppressed. And this is clearly a 12 year old who is struggling. So I feel like that makes his hip hop better. Hip hop was created for this type of resistance, which is why what that young man did was so incredibly powerful. And for him to use hip hop that way, man, that's exactly why hip hop was created and it was so beautiful to watch. Talib Kwali, thank you very much. Thank you. Despite the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, the Israeli military has arrested at least 1,500 Palestinian Israelis who were protesting against Israel's actions in the occupied Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, Al-Aqsa Mosque, and Gaza. As Israeli forces continued their military raids in cities predominantly inhabited by Palestinian Israelis who make up about 21% of Israel's citizens, more than 500 staffers from the Biden administration and the Democratic Party have called on the U.S. president to, quote, work to end the underlying conditions of occupation, blockade, and settlement expansion that led to this exceptionally destructive period in a 73-year history of dispossession and ethnic cleansing. They also expressed their deep concern that Israel continues to, quote, use U.S.-funded military equipment to kill civilians and violently suppress protesters in Israel, the West Bank, and Jerusalem. For more on the growing solidarity movement in the U.S. with Palestinians, I'm joined by Black Lives Matter activist and co-founder of Black Liberation Collective, Zeli Imani, and Maitha Al-Hassan, a historian, journalist, and social justice artist. Zeli and Maitha, thank you both so much for being with me. Zeli, let me ask you first. You've been a very strong supporter of the BLM movement, obviously. You've also been a strong, consistent defender of Palestinian rights. Why is this fight so important for you? Yes. Um, Black Lives Matter as a global movement stands in solidarity with the people of Palestine. Um, Black people throughout the world, we know injustice, we know oppression, we know genocide, we know apartheid, we know the taste of tear gas. And we also know that people who are outside protesting in Palestine are tasting tear gas today in order to taste freedom tomorrow. And these are the same truths that we know. And we know that in order to end oppression here in America, we have to be supporting other liberation struggles elsewhere. And we deeply understand that black people in America will never be free until the Palestinian people are free as well. My thought, two different but two very similar struggles. Uh, the, the issue of injustice being at the core of this, and Zeli just spoke about the taste of tear gas that communities here in the United States, the African-American community, has endured, and of course, something that Palestinians have lived with as well for a long time. In one of its statements, uh, BLM said the Palestinian fight for justice and equality harkens to our struggle against a repressive state apparatus. Our struggles are connected in many ways, not least because the same Israeli forces forcibly expelling the original inhabitants of Sheikh Jarrah train repressive police forces around the world, including here in the United States. How significant a factor is this for both sides? The public discourse that really linked the movements that were happening, Black Lives Matter, and resistance to settler colonialism in occupied Palestine became very clear with the Ferguson uprisings in 2014. If you remember, Gaza was being bombarded again just a couple of weeks before Michael Brown was murdered in and laid in his blood for four and a half hours. And so when Palestinians tweeted out tips for what to do when you are hit with that taste of tear gas, to use milk instead of water. There was an organic grassroots movement that was building, and people started to realize not only were police forces being trained, U.S. police forces, by the IDF in Israel, but there were other connections between Western colonial apparatuses, global apparatuses of, the, of continuing to oppress folks. And something else that came out was the tear gas used in Ferguson on the U.S.-Mexico border, tear gas used against Egyptian protesters, the tear gas used in occupied Palestine was made in the same factory in Pennsylvania. So people were making these connections, but it's also a very historic uh, 
relationship that has been built over decades. And so many of the same lethal tactics, aggressive tactics being used by police officers, Zeli. The murder of George Floyd last year, making everyone stop and consider the grave injustices facing the African-American community and communities of color here in the United States. Uh, police using their sheer forced against unarmed black men, the impunity and lack of accountability. And there have been countless images as well of Palestinian necks being crushed under the knees of Israeli soldiers. I know you have shared a few on your Twitter feed, but where is the outrage? It doesn't seem to exist. Yeah, I think that for such a long time in America, the discourse and the discussion has been um, purposely been repressed. For so long, anyone who wanted to speak out against the injustices in um, occupied Palestine, they were labeled anti-Semitic, or they were gaslighted by being told that the situation was complicated. But it's not complicated, right? The ethnic cleansing is, is not complicated at all. And that when you're able to explain what's the, the situation to Palestine, people are understanding injustice because they hear experience injustice. And the issue isn't rather that people are trying to uh, you know, ignore the conversation because it's complicated. People are you know, purposely being misinformed and purposely being misled. In my thought, there is that uh, almost deliberate, well, quite deliberate campaign to disinform the public. Zali obviously alluded to it. BLM statement of solidarity with Palestinians led to this online campaign accusing it of supporting Hamas's militant leaders in Gaza, not the people of Palestine living under a brutal military occupation. How do these false accusations, how does this deliberate conflation of anti-Semitism with criticism of the policies of a right-wing Israeli government that continues to perpetuate its occupation affect the resolve of some Americans to stand by Palestinians? Are you seeing more people beginning to see past this attempt to link the two? I mean, there's an outward slander of people like Bella Hadid and Dua Lipa through New York Times ads that were taken out and trying to label them terrorist sympathizers for supporting Palestinian human rights. So this one image also harkens back to a long history of trying to stigmatize or take down anybody that's spoken out in support of Palestine. I'll give you an example. Mark Lamont Hill went on a delegation that I co-organized of dream defenders, of Black Lives Matter activists to Palestine in January 2015. And what he saw there was so astounding he continued to go back and create relationships with Afro-Palestinians, with people who work around um, ending the carceral um, state. And he, when he came back and spoke to the UN on International Solidarity with Palestine Day, the next day CNN fired him. So there are repercussions. And I, I want to remind folks that when Black people stand up for Palestinians, for Arabs, for, Mo for Muslims, and of course they can be included in all these categories as well, that we also have to put our lives on the line to stand up for Black lives. And today we, we are thinking and remembering the murder of George Floyd, as you mentioned, Rida. We also have to, Palestinians, Arabs in the diaspora in the U.S., have to remember how we show up in Black communities, including owning grocery stores that call the police on Black people when we know what the end result will be. Maitha Al-Hassan and Zeli Imani, a fascinating discussion. Thank you both so much for being with me. Thank you. Thank you. The connection between the Black Lives Matter movement and the ongoing brutal occupation of Palestine is easy to make. Simply put, it is about discrimination, prejudice, and the denial of basic human rights. In the United States, many African Americans have long supported and seen themselves as part of the Palestinian struggle for justice. Their history sets them apart, but their fight against segregation, against discrimination, unites them. Malcolm X was among the first to recognize that. When in 2006, President Jimmy Carter published his book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, he was vilified by many for daring to make such a linkage. Except he wasn't really. 
He was forewarning Israel that if it did not make peace with Palestinians, it would inevitably turn into an apartheid state. Now, after the so-called nation-state law, enacted by the Israeli Knesset, codified apartheid-like rules, the similarities are being exposed and understood by a growing number of Americans, including American Jews, who are beginning to question why their tax money should fund not just a wealthy country, but an occupying power. So in short, while time may have closed on Carter's advice to Israel to choose peace over apartheid, the BLM movement may be helping a growing number of Americans better understand the Palestinian question, the realities of daily humiliation, of an ongoing colonial project to dispossess, occupy, and ultimately suffocate an entire people by leaning on its neck. That's it from me, Rida Fahri, for this week from the entire team here in Washington. Thanks for watching.